my name is uh, Leticia Dragan. I am um, originally French, but I've been living in Romania in the past uh, 12 years. I originally came here uh, after I graduated from social work, and I really wanted to have an experience working with children from the orphanage and street kids, because we all heard about them um, at some point, and I really wanted to do that. And so I came here um, and I started working originally for six months, then another two years. And uh, then years went by and I stayed here. And um, one thing that I noticed working all those years with the, those at-risk groups that um, many of the children had in the past either been sexually exploited, some of them were in the present, even when they were in the child center um, and also I found out that many of them who are exiting the orphanages and um, the children's home they were getting also into prostitution some of them because they had no place where to go and they were so vulnerable so after um, many years working with them I thought I wanted to do some change and I thought that would be um, something I would like to get involved in. And so I uh, started an organization called Associata Free, um, which aims at fighting um, against sexual exploitation here in Romania. Um, our organization um, works with at different levels. And one of the first uh, level we started working with was doing just public awareness. Uh, so we had different campaigns just to make people uh, aware of what was happening. We also at one point created some prevention resources. We have made a comic strip book, 3D, it's called uh, Decision Determined Destiny. And um, we have there um, three different stories of girls ending up in, um, in being trafficking and something interactive. And we have also a curriculum that goes with it with six lessons. It's available online and anybody can download it and use it. So we have this part of prevention and part of it is also a small group we have in one of the areas where a lot of prostitution was happening, still is, but a little bit less in the few past years because there's been a lot of intervention from the police. And so we have this small group there every week meeting with us and most of them are coming from families where somebody is involved in prostitution, either directly in prostitution or in pimping. We also have children from the pimps coming to that group. Um, other project is outreach, and that's one of the main ones. That's really one that uh, got, it, we got us started and um, that we are very passionate about. Um, we started doing outreach in the streets here in, uh, in Bucharest, and then we started um, other people in other cities start also similar outreaches in cities like Constanza, in Tigishwara, and Tergumuresh, and um, a few other cities also. Um, then later on, we started doing outreach also indoors, which is something I think we are the only one doing at the moment in Romania. Um, and recently, we've been trying to reach out also to women advertising online because since prostitution is illegal. In Romania, um, we don't see as many on the streets than maybe in other areas of Europe. But many of the women are actually um, doing it in a closed environment, in apartments they're renting and advertising online. And I would say the last part of our work is a part of uh, restoration. And so we have two parts in it. One is just like a drop-in where a woman can come and receive social services, counseling. Uh, and the other part for women who really are in difficult situation and who need help, we have also a shelter where a woman can come uh, and receive help to get out of their situation. We offer in the shelter, we do offer um, um, psychological counseling for most of the women. Some of them, uh, they're not in a state where uh, they want to receive that help or they're not in a state where they're ready to receive it. So at the moment we have a woman, for example, who's um, still quite traumatized and she has also very low IQ. And so we talked with a psychologist and she thought it was a bit too early 
at the moment to start counseling. Um, and I don't know how it is in other countries, but here in Romania, a lot of people are kind of resisting um, counseling. They think it's for crazy people. So we do encourage uh, all the women from the shelter to do it, but some of them are really hard to <laughs> convince. So it doesn't work all the time. For the women from the drop-in center, uh, we don't have specific funds for that. Um, we do have sometimes volunteers that offer to do free counseling sessions. And also, uh, in some particular cases, we do offer counseling when we think it's really needed and the person is open for it. Most of the women we meet uh, in the streets uh, are usually open for um being in a relationship with us, like meeting us on the streets, receiving coffee or something. Um, we do see that at the beginning, some of them have um, some fears. And usually the ones who are really like controlled, they will be the ones who don't really want to get into relationship with us and who will um, be more fearful. And they don't usually come to the drop-in. Some of them might accept eventually talk with us on the streets and receive something from us. but. Uh, often they won't, um, that would be the only thing they do. They won't go further. Um, but yeah, we reach out to most um, most of the women. Uh, and we also get referrals. But yeah, I think something important to build trust with them is consistency. Um, that's not always easy to offer. Um, we try to have that, but you know how it is in teams. Sometimes we have people changing. Mm -hmm. um, volunteers go, come and go, and even like staff members change. And uh, that's a bit something difficult because um, we realize for the women it's really important to have like one, at least in the group, one anchor, one person who, who they know for a long time and who they trust, um, who've been consistently coming to see them. Um, so I've been, for example, one of the first ones to start and uh, I'm still involved after <laughs> obviously some years, but I'm not going as often now because of my family situation uh, because I have to stay home uh, more often. But, um, I think, uh, the girls appreciate when I still take time to go on the streets and continue to see them once in a while when I make, I have this possibility. Um, I think it's important also just to be friendly, you know, uh, a smile on your face. I mean, most of them, they can think, okay, this person wants something from me. And some of them at the beginning, they might refuse because they think nothing is free, you know, everybody wants something from us. But um, I think what's helping, helped us in this is that we always have girls who've known us for a long time. And then they tell the new ones about us. And then that helps build the trust because then they know where are people, serious people. And I think another important thing is just not making too much promises. Uh, we always try to keep promises low, you know, but uh, actually be able to do what we say we can do. Um, and that's something really important because it's easy to make promises. The pimps, they make all kind of promises and this is what is keeping them on the street because they always have that hope that one day he will change, one day we're going to get married, one day we'll have a shop and I won't be here anymore. But then it never happens. And so it's really important for us not just sell dreams and cheap hope, but actually be able to do uh, what we say we're going to do. And of course we can... It's important also our role is to connect them because sometimes they don't have, it's just about having the right connections or the right information or just helping them make uh, them see a bit clearer in their mess in the mind, you know? Sometimes they don't know where to start from. But that doesn't mean you have to do everything. So it's just often, you know, just making the right connection, explaining certain things, how they were, what could exist, you know? Um, but eventually they have to do it. We've seen also from experiences that when you carry somebody on your back, you know, and she's not actually making the effort for the change, then it doesn't work on the long term. So when we describe victims of trafficking, a lot of people we say 
it can be anybody. And it's true, it can be anybody. So we've met girls, uh, some of the girls we've helped, they were from like wealthy families, uh, living in the best uh, neighborhood in town, mom working in the bank, going on holidays in Dubai. And she still got herself into that. Um, then, of course, most of the girls are not like that. And most of the girls come from poor families. Um, but what I would say, one of the main thing I've seen throughout the years is one of the common points they have is dysfunctional families. And this is for the poor, this is for the rich. It doesn't matter, you know, uh, how wealthy you are. Uh, it's true that poverty push, pushes you. It's one of the factors, but it's not it's not the only one, and I don't know if it's the main one, you know. I've seen that dysfunctional families, families that are not working well, where parents are going abroad and not taking time with their children, where the children are left by themselves, or maybe parents working too many hours and uh, not spending the time uh, they should with the children. Um, this is one of the main things. And of course, because I've been in working in orphanages, it's true that the girls and the boys from the orphanages are one of the most vulnerable categories I've seen. I don't say that all the people getting into trafficking come from that environment, but um, those who are... Um, yeah, but it's true that those who who don't have a family, who've been raised in orphanage, they are less ready to face a dependent life. They are less protected. Um, they don't have those strong relationships that keep you strong and safe, and so they are very vulnerable. Prevention is something that's not easy. It's easy yeah. to call prevention a program which is giving information about trafficking, but that's not really a prevention because actually prevention means stopping all those vulnerable factors, which often even the state don't have the power to um, not have a lot of power to influence. Like how can you encourage parents to get involved with their children or how can you um, prevent abuse in families, uh, fathers of being drunk and coming and doing crazy things home, you know. A lot of things have to do with the family itself, you know. Um, and I think it's hard to influence families, you know, I mean, I think you can, <laughs> there are certain ways where you can at some point influence and encourage parents to get involved. And there are campaigns that are being done where they do encourage parents to get involved with their children, don't leave them home by themselves when you go to Spain to work or to Germany or wherever. Uh, but that's eventually not really helpful because most of the people, um, they have deeper issues in the back, why they are doing that, you know, and the thing also is just like the economic situation. Um, parents leave to other countries because they need money, uh, because uh, salaries are still low in Romania and they cannot meet uh, the needs of their family. And so how can you change that in a whole country, you know, I mean, it's, it's not easy, you know, to some of things is just about culture, you know, it's like the patriarchy. I don't know how to say it. Is it okay? Patriarchy? Yes. Yeah. Patriarchy, I think. Patriarchy mentality also, you know, like still a lot of um, people in Romania, uh, they don't talk about abuse, you know. I mean, they don't uh, recognize abuse, you know. For them, a woman being beaten up by her husband is something normal, you know. Uh, something needed. Um, a girl who's being um, molested, it's her fault, you know, because she probably done something wrong. She probably dressed uh, too short and this is her fault, you know. And there was actually, I don't know if you heard, but there was a big scandal uh, just a few weeks ago because we had one girl, 15 years old, who was kidnapped um, while going home and she was held into a house she called the police i think three times uh, and gave indication clearly of where she was and uh, it took 19 hours for the police to intervene in the house and when they intervened the girl 
was had already been killed, burned, disappeared. And um, even during that scandal, we could see how people reacted, like in the media, some saying that, oh, it was her fault. Why would you get into the car of somebody you don't know, you know? But she was doing um, stop out of stop, I don't know, hitchhiking. Yeah, hitchhiking. hitchhiking. Yeah, to get home. And uh, a lot of people, you know, they just have this tendency to just throw the blame on the victim, you know. And this is just one story, but there were so many other scandals recently of even like a middle-aged woman who was going back home and taken by a group of young people, raped and left in a field by herself, completely hurt, and she died there. And same thing, you know, it's like, People don't think it's a big deal, you know, that things like this are happening. And um, the aggressors are going often unpunished or very little punished. I think this is really something the state should uh, work uh, on. And they are working at the moment because they have pressure. Um, but that you really need to punish in general abuse, you know, and in general such act against women, you know, because... Uh, if you just leave it like that, people, the mentality is not going to change and people will just continue thinking it's okay yeah. that women are being mistreated. I think there's uh, recently there's been more awareness since I started. Um, when I started, actually, and we started by awareness because we I hadn't witnessed many complaints about human trafficking. Um, but uh, at the time we started, we had also a few other organizations who started one of them, they focused on prevention and awareness. That was their main focus. And um, even with the national agency, they've been trying to do campaigns. So people are more aware. The media also took over and had different um, documentaries. And so I think people now are aware that human trafficking is happening in Romania. Um, what's not being done so well is, for example, the numbers of identified victims of, in the official records, it's, uh, it's never, never been so low in the past year. And so the national agency in one part are saying there's less victims of trafficking, but most people and organizations believe actually that the victims are not being identified as well, which is not a good thing, you know. Um, another thing is just like, I don't want to get too much into, into that, but the political climate at the moment in Romania is not a very good one. And we've seen a lot of corruption at a very high level. I mean, the one main political party which is ruling at the moment is involved in many scandals um, on uh, corruption. And uh, some are being seen uh, hanging out with some of the mafia groups. <laughs> <laughs> that we are fighting against. So it's not really a climate where you think that, um, um, I don't think there is a lot of willingness of a main party to see corruption really disappear. On the other side, there is also good people. I mean, uh, even in the police, in the organized crime, there are very good people, professional people who are really dedicated to do that, to do their job well. And so, um, there are people being arrested, there are prosecution happening. It's, yeah, we still have a lot to do. <laughs> prostitution is, is been decriminalized in 2016, so it's not mm -hmm. a crime anymore, but it's, there are still contravention. So okay. contravention means like a lot of fines. <laughs> uh, they get for disturbing public order. That's for the girls around the streets. Um, so it's it's better. It's better than what it was before. And I don't get they don't, don't go to prison anymore for that. Uh, but what is a difficulty that they have those fine is uh, that when they want to stop and they want to find a job, um, they have all those debts towards the um, towards the government, and so uh, they they block a part of their salary. Uh, they have to pay their fines, you know. And so that's something that's discouraging a lot of women to find legal jobs because they feel overwhelmed that, okay, that my salary is going to be so small now and still I'll have maybe 20, 30% that will go towards um, 
uh, towards the fines, yeah, for yeah. some years. So that's that's something that's uh, that's negative. Honestly, as an organization, I don't believe in legalization, but it's true that um, the fact that girls are still seen not as criminal anymore, but still as uh, people bothering and doing something that's not okay is not helpful for the girls. So I think um, it would be more helpful to have a way to criminalize uh, pimps yeah. um, and people behind it, maybe clients. But it's true that for the girls, they should be really like free of all kind of uh, debts, uh, violence. Um, normally, they're not allowed the police to talk bad with the girls, even if, you know, I mean, they should be behaving. But what I was talking to you about mm -hmm. uh, mentality, um, yeah, this is the reality. It's not something like, okay you tell the police guy don't behave well with the girls because it's not okay to do prostitution but it's just the way most of the police officers are they believe yeah. that she's a woman she's making more money than i am uh, i can do whatever i want i can talk to her rudely i can push her uh, so there are some um, abuse done by the police and yeah, not necessarily because of the law, but just because of this mentality that is behind and that needs to be changed. And I think the police officers should be trained um, and should be held responsible when they are misbehaving with the girls. Because often girls don't report abuse from the police because they think, okay, if he's abusing them, why should I go to another police guy and tell him his colleague was abusing me, you know? Yeah. How can he just... Uh, gets forgotten, nobody talks about it, nobody knows what to do about it. And um, then it continues, and that's not okay.